Hi there, Megan May here. This is our fourth of four short videos on blood and cardiac infections. This one's going to focus on bacteremia and sepsis. All right, so our outline for the fourth time uh, indicates that we are now focusing way down here. So this was one, this was two, this was three, and now you are here. Yay, finally. Um, this sounds a little odd that we have this differentiated between bacteremias and clinical sepsis. And this sounds like a semantic issue, but in actuality, its clinical relevance is quite different. So bacteremia literally means any state of having bacteria in the bloodstream. And this is quite different than clinical sepsis. Clinical sepsis is an active infection that's fulminant and systemic and throughout the entire body, including the bloodstream and the endothelium and everything else. Bacteremia is almost always asymptomatic. Uh, we are all transiently bacteremic virtually every day of our lives. Um, every time you brush your teeth, you become slightly bacteremic because you put microscopic scratches in your gums and your oral flora gets into your bloodstream. That does not cause you any kind of consequence. Clinical sepsis is obviously quite different than that. Um, where you have active infections spreading from one side of the body to the other, in between you have a transient bacteremia happening. However, that's not even what I'm talking about when I have this bullet point here. When I have bacteremias, as a, as a type of infection, what I'm referring to are bacterial organisms that specifically target and, and have as a preferred site of infection being the circulatory system. And there are four of them that we're going to talk about, and I'm sure you've actually heard of at least two of them, believe it or not. Uh, and then I'm going to talk a little bit about clinical sepsis and what blanket statements we can make about it. So bacteremias, primary bacteremias, I should say, are usually exclusively tick-borne infections. So your flags to um, think about when you're looking at a, a primary bacteremia are a recent tick bite or outdoor activity where you'd have potential for tick exposure. Implicit in that is, once again, the idea that you're going to have a seasonality to these diseases. If it's warm out, if you have ticks out, it's possible that you're going to have infection. If it's cold out and the ticks are frozen under the ground or under the leaf litter, then you're not going to see these in anybody who hasn't been traveling. Okay, so these all present with some commonalities, and they are, once again, kind of standard influenza-like illnesses. You have fever, malaise, myalgia, the trifecta of awfulness. These guys come in very non-specifically. Two of the four have additional kind of helpful signs to guide you. Uh, the other two are pretty hard to tell apart without very uh, specific molecular diagnostics where you're looking for specific DNA sequences for these guys. The good news is they're all treated by the same course of the same antibiotic. The bad news is it's not a typical course nor a typical first-line antibiotic, so you kind of have to know that you're dealing with these infections. The treatment that we're going to be looking at is at least three weeks of a drug called doxycycline. And now that I said that, I'm sure some of you can figure out at least one of these what it's, what it's going to be. All right. That being said, the first one that I'm going to talk about is one you may not have heard of. And this is a disease called ehrlichiosis. So this is infection of, of um, white blood cells in the bloodstream with any of a few species from the genus Ehrlichia. The most common one is an organism called Ehrlichia chaffiensis, but again, there are multiple species that can cause very similar clinical disease. What you see as, as kind of uh, characteristic on blood smears is that you can see these marks called morulae. That's plural, morula is a singular. That is these big, dark, dense dots, and I just covered it, I realized, but the little dots on the edge of uh, white blood cells. 
very classically representative of ehrlichiosis. These ones you'll see are in lymphocytes, so you have these kind of dark, dense purple cells. On the other hand, another organism called anaplasma, and we've got two pathogenic species of anaplasma. We have uh, anaplasma phagocytophilum and anaplasma marginale. These guys also create morula within white blood cells, except they prefer macrophages over lymphocytes. The point re being is that you may see these on a blood smear, more likely in, in uh, clinical practice what you would do if you suspected either of these infections is that you would draw blood and send it to a reference lab that could be the Mayo Clinic or the CDC or something like that um, that is going to be able to give you a, a molecular nucleic acid based diagnosis of either Ehrlichia species or Anaplasma species. The good news is, again, either one of these you can treat with three to six weeks of doxycycline. So that being said, the, the implication here is that a lot of times these aren't specifically diagnosed because it almost isn't necessary. It's not going to change your clinical behavior. That being said, um, myself being a, being, a, being a scientist and being a person who likes to understand how outbreaks develop and progress and everything else, it's really helpful to me if you do diagnose it because then we know uh, in, in my line of work what is going on and, and what infections are where in the country and how many there actually are. Um, but that being said, that's that's a, a rant for another day, I suppose. The next one is the one you will uh, undoubtedly heard of. So Borrelia burgdorferi, uh, the causative agent of Lyme disease, is a bacteremic infection. You see it in the bloodstream. We hear about it more often uh, colonizing the joints, sometimes invading and colonizing the central nervous system. Um, and certainly earlier in this series of videos, we talked about it infecting the heart. Uh, but one of the great commonalities of Lyme disease is that you do find it in the bloodstream. And by the way, this is about a one in a zillion picture. It's not easy to find an image like this where you see these beautiful spirochetes hanging around um, uh, in and amongst red blood cells. You don't typically diagnose Lyme disease via blood smear. You usually diagnose it via serology, um, meaning you, you um, test patients to see if they've raised an antibody response to Borrelia. And that works reasonably well. It does not work super great. It doesn't work super great because of the timeline of a humoral immune response. So think back to um, what you learned about B cells and the time frame of, of that antibody, strong antibody response. It's about, you know, 14 days, 21 days to get a really super vigorous response that is going to be detectable by a fairly low affinity lab test, which this one is. And so a lot of times what, what you can see is you have a patient that clinically is very consistent with Lyme disease, uh, yet tests negative. If you test them again three or four weeks later, they sometimes have converted and are now seropositive. So they did have Lyme disease. They were just testing negative because they didn't have strong enough titer yet. Um, that being said, telling apart Lyme disease from anaplasmosis or ehrlichiosis can be pretty straightforward in that you have this very characteristic erythema migraines rash or the, the bullseye rash, so to speak. We've all seen that one where you have this red dot at the side of a tick bite and then you have red rings that kind of circle out from there. Um, I believe we talked about this when we talked about neurological infections, but just in case we could use a refresher, not all Lyme patients get that bullseye rash, so that's very important to remember. If you see it, it's a slam dunk, uh, given these other clinical parameters. But if you don't see it, it's not necessarily something you should exclude. Okay, soapbox about Lyme disease over. And now the last bacteremia that I want to talk about is the one that's got the, actually the highest mortality rate. And... It's another one you might have heard of, but you probably didn't think of it as a bacteremic disease. And that is Rocky Mountain Spotted Fever. We think of that as a rashy disease, but, you know, quite frankly, it's, it's um, when you learn about the rash, it's, it's quite clear that it is indeed a bacteremia. So this 
disease is caused by an organism called Rickettsia or Rickettsiae. And when this causes bloodstream infections, the damage that it does to the endothelium gives you a particular type of rash that we've already mentioned in this video series, and that is a petechial rash. So all of these dots here are petechia. They're those nice pinpoint hemorrhage, hemorrhages where you have leakage of the capillaries into tissues. And I'm so sorry for the delay. I'm having a cat issue. In other words, my cat just walked in front of my tablet. Sorry about that. Um, all right, where was I? And as this disease progresses, you can see some of these guys kind of merging into one and then you have uh, what's called a purple rash. But basically, this, this rash is very characteristic of this disease. It, again, um, when you have this rash appearing after a few days of these clinical signs uh, in the right part of the country and in the right season, uh, you, you have a, a good reason to suspect that this is what you may be looking at and, and you need to get it evaluated and tested. Um, the issue... <laughs> I hope no one can hear that, but there's a purring cat snuggling on this iPad. I apologize if there's weird background noise. Um, <laughs> I'd be tempted to re-record this slide, but this is too hilarious not to keep, so, you know, it's staying. Okay, so we have our petechia rash, our pur purpural rash, and um, what we're <laughs> what we're left with at this point is um, having to diagnose a patient with Rocky Mountain spotted fever, which you must do, and it must be treated quite aggressively, particularly if it's progressed to to this point because this disease can be, can be fatal, and it's got a respectable mortality rate as, as uh, bacteremias go. This guy, this guy, and this guy do not have particularly high mortality rates, excluding Lyme carditis, mind you. Um, but this guy does, so this is one that we really need to be careful of. Patients um, do respond to doxycycline, but at times it has to be given intravenously. Apologies for the formatting on this slide, it got lost in translation a little bit. But what you have here are four maps from the U.S. Centers for Disease Control. And what they're showing are the geographic distributions and number of cases of Ehrlichia here, Rickettsia here, Anaplasma here, and uh, Borrelia here. One important thing to point out is that Ehrlichiosis, rickettsiosis, and anaplasmosis, these uh, incidence maps are collected over a period between the years 2000 and 2013. This Lyme incidence map is only from the year 2014. A couple of take-homes from a slide that looks like this. The first being that Lyme disease, as you could imagine from this density, and this only being one year, this is far and away the most common of these four infections. If you had to put money on one of them, I would put it on Lyme Borreliosis, just by the numbers alone. The other thing that is clear is that even though these are all tick-borne diseases, they don't have the same geographic distribution. And that is quite uh, commonly related to where their uh, species of tick vector lives. So I've... I've uh, joked in class previously that saying mosquito is a bit like saying bird and that you have eagles and you have penguins and they're and you have flamingos and they're all equally birds but they're nowhere near the same thing um, ticks are more or less like that as well and so a tick that's capable of spreading one of these diseases may or may not be able to spread one of the others so their geographic distribution again is really tied to uh, tick vector competence so that being said, it might be good to know where in which parts of the country you are more or less likely to see some of these things. If it is, if you live, say, in Maine, for example, if you had to put money on a patient who came in during tick season with fever, malaise, myalgias, 
would you guess they had rickettsiosis or would you guess they had Lyme borreliosis because Lyme is a much better guess. But anyway, I digress. Um, the other thing that I just want to add as a caveat here is ehrlichiosis and anaplasmosis especially. Uh, these are, again, diagnosed often uh, by molecular techniques and these data represent a span of history where molecular techniques, uh, both in terms of availability and specificity and awareness and everything else, have increased tremendously. And so it's, in my mind, almost a guarantee that these numbers are an underestimate, uh, but you never know. If in the coming few years there suddenly seems like there's an explosion in Ehrlichia and anaplasma cases, that may just be a detection and reporting issue. All right, so with that, we're now going to switch gears and start talking about clinical sepsis. Okay, so clinical sepsis is characterized by a very high fever and symptoms of systemic infection. And what I mean by that are typically that you have the sudden high spike in fever, you have sweating, nausea, vomiting, all that good stuff, uh, anorexia, and then that proceeds to shock eventually, and then that can lead to death. We usually don't talk just about sepsis. We usually talk about gram-negative sepsis versus gram-positive. Or um, you may not say gram-positive sepsis, but you almost always differentiate gram-negative sepsis because their clinical course is not quite the same. Pause the video for a moment. Think to yourself why that might be mechanistically. And pause. Okay, I assume you thought about that for a little bit, and hopefully came up with with something that rhymes with schmendotoxic schmock as, as a uh, probable reason. So just as a reminder, gram-positive walls and gram-negative walls are not biochemically the same, and your immune system does not, uh, sorry, your innate immune system and inflammatory mediators do not respond to them in the same way. And when you have gram-negative cells in the bloodstream, um, you have lipopolysaccharide in the bloodstream, and you are getting a very, very strong signal that is very, very pro-inflammatory. And so gram-negative sepsis has a much worse prognosis, and it tends to progress much faster, and it tends to lead to shock in a very short time frame and death in a short time frame. So if you had to choose a sepsis, you want gram positive. Neither of them are particularly exciting and good though. It's, it's not good news. Um, in terms of what are the most probable causative agents, it's really hard to say that because sepsis really can be anything. Anything that gets introduced into the bloodstream. If it is able to get a foothold and, and cause these um, shock-like symptoms, you're going to get a patient with clinical sepsis. So now on the next slide, which is the last one, I'm going to contradict that a little bit, but um, it really is, uh, I, I need you to keep an open mind when you're thinking about sepsis because really it's, Anything that gets into the bloodstream is, is potentially a cause. Um, in addition to that, I promised a former student that I would point out um, that there is also a, a um, possibility of having fungal infections in the bloodstream, and those are called fungemias. And he said, I see those in the, uh, in the ICU from time to time. This is, this is really weird. I'd never heard of that. And I said, I didn't include that in your, in your, in your lecture. But um, the reason for that is that there aren't uh, consistent causes of fungemia. They do happen, but they're very rare and they're very unusual. And so, again, with sepsis, you just have to have a very open mind because it could be anything. All right, so... That being said, what are your risk factors for sepsis? If you have a patient that appears to have 
clinical sepsis and you empirically diagnose them, you want to pull blood cultures, and before you get them back, you want to start empiric treatment. Hopefully the reason for that is obvious. Um, even though blood cultures are now done uh, on a plus minus level in an automated way, it still takes 10, 12, 18, sometimes hours to get that positive. And 10, 12, 18 hours in, in sepsis is, is, a, is a big deal. And that's a, between a patient who's still alive and treatable and a patient who is dead at times. So you want to start empiric treatment right away. Since you do not know if you're dealing with gram-positive or gram-negative sepsis, you usually start them on two courses of antibiotics at the same time, something to cover the gram-positives and something to cover the gram-negatives. Risk factors for sepsis include somebody who's got an ongoing internal infection. The most common ones that you see um, contributing to eventual sepsis are pyelonephritis, so somebody who's got a kidney infection pneumonia and septic arthritis. Those are the biggies, but it, anything is possible. Another big tip-off that you're, um, you've got a, a potential risk for sepsis is somebody who's got an intravenous injury of some kind. So this can be a deep puncture wound. Um, a, a lot of times you see these random sepsis cases popping up where Somebody's gotten, you know, a, a scratched on a tree branch in the woods and they had a really deep um, puncture with it. And then you'll wind up with that person becoming septic and then you grow some truly weird and unexpected organism out of their bloodstream because who knows what was living on the tree branch. Um, but that being said, on a more realistic note, uh, this, this would be a... a common one to look for as well, IV drug use, because you're introducing things directly into the bloodstream. We talked about that in the first video with it being a risk factor for acute endocarditis, and it is also a risk factor for sepsis. So the moral of the story is IV drug use is bad for many reasons. Um, obviously the big tip off for diagnosing sepsis uh, and confirming it is that you have positive blood cultures. So a moment ago, I said, really, it could be anything. You have to keep an open mind. However, a lot of sepsis cases that you see are, off, are healthcare associated. And the reason for that is a lot of ongoing pyelonephritis cases and pneumonia cases you tend to see in, in long-term hospitalized patients, especially ICU patients. Um, in addition to that, you might see somebody who's uh, hospitalized post-surgery come down with a surgical site infection, or you might have people who are in the ICU who get open bed sores or some other opening. That's going to predispose that person to, to clinical sepsis. The other um, issue that is huge is indwelling devices in long-term um, institutionalized patients. So these are you know, ports, catheters, um, things like that, pacemakers, all that kind of good stuff. Um, when these get colonized, if they're not, or if it's feasible to swap them, they need to be swapped frequently. So something that's feasible to swap is a catheter. Something that's not feasible to swap frequently is a pacemaker. Um, but the, the point here being that these guys are um, potential sources of infection. The bad news about all of this is that infections that are acquired in the hospital are very, very likely to exhibit multi-drug resistance. The hospital ecosystem, while fascinating scientifically, is terrifying clinically because a lot of the most common offenders for patients who develop sepsis as a consequence of health care, their sepsis is extraordinarily difficult to treat, and that's bad news. So I put in this red box here some of the top offenders for, for uh, hospital-associated um, sepsis, and they would be Klebsiella pneumoniae, Stenotrophomonas, Pseudomonas, Serratia, Staph epi, Staph aureus, Enterococcus, and Acinetobacter. All of these guys tend to be highly drug resistant, so 
it adds a layer of complexity to the treatment of sepsis. You have to start it almost immediately, and when you're dealing with these guys, you have to get it right. So the point here is that when you empirically diagnose sepsis and you make a decision on a treatment started before you have an identification or an antimicrobial susceptibility profile back on the infecting agent, you have to guess correctly. And if you're guessing based on a patient that was previously hospitalized, you're going to start them with vancomycin and piperacillin and tazobactam because these are going to treat most of these guys that are on here still. Um, vancomycin will cover the gram positives, piperacillin will cover the gram negatives, and the addition of tazobactam blocks any uh, beta-lactamase activity. So that's why a beta-lactam can still work for some of these guys. Um, that being said, if you had a patient come into the ER and they had no prior history of hospitalization and they seemed like they were um, of the deep puncher wound from a branch in the woods variety, then you might make a different treatment decision. So, that being said, that is our exhaustive uh, look at uh, blood and cardiac infections. Keep in mind, this is all just scratching the surface. Uh, second year um, of, of uh, micro in med school, you will learn about all these things again and in much greater detail. So enjoy, and I hope that was fun, and I will see you all in class.